Hey there, LifePoint. We are so glad that you have joined us online. My name is Amber. I'm the communications director here at LifePoint, and we're just so glad that you're here. If you're not joining us through the app, we would love for you to connect with us there. You can get that through any app store. So if you have a iPhone, an Android, an iPad, whatever you use to join us, you can get that app through it. So it is the church center app when you're searching for it. And then all you gotta do is search for LifePoint when you go in there and you'll be plugged in with all things that are happening here. Our app is a great resource for you. You can join online and that's where we'd love to see you. You can take your next step. You can join a group. You can see what's coming up and you can give. LifePoint, we're so thankful for your generosity because you give, we're able to do so many things, but there's just a quick and easy button on that app and it'll take you to our secure Rebel gift site where you can either give a one-time donation or a reoccurring gift. So thank you for that. We'd also love for you to be inviting people to join us online. You can really join online from anywhere. It doesn't even have to be a friend close to you. So if you're wanting some family friends to join you on a Sunday morning or even during the week, that's totally possible. So you can send them the app and they can join us there too. So we're really excited that you are here and joining us online. We hope you enjoy this message. I can't help but notice an uncanny resemblance in that last character to someone who is on staff here. And uh, our communications director is mysteriously not here this Sunday. She put this up here for all of you guys to see and y'alls to see. So I hope you enjoyed that. We are in this series called Wisdom, emphasis on the dumb part. And, uh, you know, there, it's really hard to describe what's going through a 10-year-old's brain when they're jumping over a couch onto a freshly mopped floor. And it's because there's nothing up there. And I know that because that's what I did as a 10-year-old. A 10-year-old used to live in Riverside, California. Hold the booze, please. I know Californians. If you're in California, you, you are welcome here. Wear it proudly. But now you're in Nevada. It's okay. So at 10 years old, my mom was gone. And I would often invite, uh, you know, just guys over to my house. We weren't guys. We were only 10-year-old. We were punks at 10 years old. And one time, uh, I had to mop the floor. My mom gave me some chores. And so I said, we can make this more challenging and more fun. And so I mopped the floor with my friend. And we were running across the carpet. And we were sliding on it. And of course, that's not enough for a 10-year-old boy. So we decided to put a couch in the way and we would jump over the couch, land on our feet and slide across. Very cool. At least in theory, that is what it had. Not, not a lot of philosophy when you're 10 years old and you don't really think things through. And so I jumped over the couch, landed on my feet, slid across uh, the kitchen and hit the back of uh, my back against the counter and I began to fall forward. Now, what do you do when you fall? You put out your arms like a normal, sane, intelligent person. That is not what I did. So I'm falling forward and instead of putting my hands forward, I tried to grab the counter on my back. And I went from a standing position, I bashed my face on the tile and I fractured my skull in three places. And then a week later, the top of my head swelled over my eye, and they called me Quasimodo for like a month. 
It was terrible. In fact, it was so bad they couldn't get, like, at least at the time, some medical devices to be able to, like, move things around. So they just had to wait for it to slow down. I could have used some wisdom that day. I could have used my mom's presence, right? So in this, in this series, not only are we trying to help you escape head injuries, but we want you to be able to live wise lives. The tagline to this is the smarter way to a better life. And so we hope that in this series, you will have a better life. In fact, there are very few times that I can guarantee you having a better life. I notice the word is better, not easier. Better and easier are not synonyms. And so in this, we're going to look at a bunch of different wisdom literatures. This is uh, one of our series that's in the Bible in a Year series. If you didn't know, we're going thematically through the Bible. And through over the next five weeks, we're going to go through the Proverbs. Uh, it's been two weeks there. We're going to go through Job uh, for two weeks there. And then we're going to go through Ecclesiastes. And so today, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the reading plan, which you can get uh, outside. We hope you'll pick it up. And we hope you will go through the wisdom literature literature because it's really easy to read. It's really easy to apply. And over the next five weeks, probably some of the most practical teaching and practical takeaways you'll get throughout this entire series. And so today, this message is called Foolproof, Foolproof. And the reason we entitled it that is what we, we want to say it this way, is, you know, it's okay to be born a fool, but it's not okay to live like one. You know, when you're a kid and you're growing up and you do foolish things, it's, it's accepted. You, you have people who are next to you who tell you not to do things because they have wisdom and they have experience and knowledge, but eventually you have to grow up and eventually it's no longer acceptable to be a fool. In fact, in the Bible, calling someone a fool is one of the most offensive things. Some of you are like, I can think of some other F words, but this is the one that the Bible uses. To call someone a fool is, is paramount to them just being stupid or dumb, useless, not going the ways, way the ways of God, being wicked. It's all sorts of bad. And so in the Bible, when they call people a fool, it is something that you want to avoid at all costs. And so what we hope to do in this series, and this is advice for us first. It's not like we have it all figured out, which is the reason we're reading the Bible reading plan and reading all these as well. And as I study these scriptures and teach them, I get all sorts of insights that I go, man, I wish I had applied that when I was younger. I would have saved myself from a lot. So it's okay to be born a fool. It's not okay to live like one. And all of us have done some foolish things, and some of them we wish other people didn't know about, but they do. And so we want to do our best to help people live wise lives. Now, in this series, we're going to have a, a, a series verse. Sometimes we do this. In this series, we're going to have it. It's, it's come from Proverbs chapter 3. And it says this, happy is the man who finds wisdom, man or woman, who finds wisdom and who acquires understanding. For she, she, and it's very fascinating because wisdom in scripture is personified as a woman. And all the ladies said amen to that, right? But... Don't worry, there are other times the Bible is an equal opportunity offender, I promise you, because women are also not portrayed well, men are also not portrayed well. You'll learn a little bit more about that next week. I'm going to offend all of you next week. You're going to want to be here for that. Don't worry about it. So, for she is more profitable. Again, wisdom is personified as a woman. Even in Greek uh, mythology, Sophia is often a woman. So for she is more profitable than silver, her revenue is better than gold, and she's more precious than jewels, and nothing you desire can equal her. Long life is in her right hand, and in her left hand is riches and honors. Her ways are pleasant, all of her paths are peaceful, and she is a tree of life to those who embrace her and to those who are, hold on to her are happy. And this sounds beautiful, it's poetic, it's intentionally meant to be that way, but it's also a way of saying wisdom is something that guides. And I love that scripture personifies wisdom. And the reason that is so important is that because Hebrew literature is vastly different from Greek literature and Greek mythology. And the reason I mention that is most people, when they think of wisdom, they probably think of the word Sophia. They probably think of Greek philosophers standing there pontificating and looking up into the sky and asking a billion annoying questions. That's what most people think of when they think of philosophy or wisdom. And that has a way uh, of helping people. But in the Greek sense, wisdom was like looking at... So hopefully objectively, but looking at the universe and trying to draw big conclusions from it and trying to make um, 
observations that would help people. Whereas Hebrew literature is different. Hebrew literature in terms of wisdom is not the same as Greek. It's actually based on a very personal relationship with God. And while Greeks would look at the world and they would try to inductively determine what the universe had as universal laws, Hebrew literature would say in a monotheistic way that there is one God who is personal and who loves and cares for us and his ways are the ways that we need to go by. His ways and his wisdom are better than ours. So vastly different forms of wisdom. Now in this, ho- in this series, we, we have a hope for you. Sometimes we have a thesis, but in this series, I want to do a series hope for you, and it's this. The series hope is this. Living wisely will help you navigate the way to a better life. When you live wisely, you will have a better life. And the reason I can say that is because scripture says that. As we look through this series, not only in the words of Solomon and Job and his friend, then again in Solomon, we're going to look at how wisdom actually helps you have a better life. And for those of you who have seen many winters, you know that this is the case. Is there, there are things that if you were to go back and tell yourself with the experience and knowledge and wisdom that you have, you know that you could have helped present pain, heartache, you could have been more successful, or maybe you just could have told your younger self, hey, stop being an idiot on this date, and it's going to help you out a lot. You know that you could gift yourself wisdom when you were younger that would make your life better. Now, there, there are three questions when it, we ask when anyone makes a decision, because ultimately wisdom is hopefully found in your decision making. We're going to talk a little bit about this next week, but wisdom is not just a head thing, it is a heart thing, and I'll explain that in just a second. But wisdom that is not applied is totally useless, and we're going to talk about that a little bit next week, so I won't spoil it for you. But in terms of decision making, what we hope is you get a, a wise piece of advice, or you have a wise decision, and then you act on it. But there are probably three ways that you make a decision, and I make a decision. And they're all questions. The first one is, what do I want to do? And it's based on our wants. This one's very simple. What do I want to do today? Do I want to go to the beach? Do I want to go buy a car? Do I want to hang out? Do I want to take a nap? It's just based on our wants. And I don't know if you know this, but you and I don't always have the best wisdom in doing what we want to do, like jumping over a couch, right? It's not a good thing. So sometimes when we want to do, sometimes it's based on good things, sometimes it's not. So that's the first way we often make a decision. What do I want to do? What do I want to own? Who do I want to be? The second one is, what can I do? Maybe there's some parameters. It's based on our worries. Maybe we say, what can I do? What kind of car can I buy? What can I do with my time today? I'm worried that I won't be able to finance it or afford it. I'm worried that I won't be able to go do this thing. I'm worried about what other people are saying. I'm worried about the economy. I'm worried about who's in the White House. I'm worried about all sorts of different Different things. And we go, I don't know what I can do. And we feel like sometimes our options are so limited and we only have a small amount of breathing room to be able to make a decision. But these two aren't the best ways to make a decision. The third one is arguably the best. And what should I do, which is based on God's wisdom? What should I do based on my circumstances and my experience and my history and my potential future? What should I do? We push away the, the constraints and we push away our wants and we look to God's wisdom to say in this moment, in this big decision and in the small ones, what should I do? You know, this one question will save you so much heartache. What should I do? Most of us don't ask this question. We ask the first two. What do I want or what can I do? Should is entirely different. A couple more things before we get to Scripture. I want to talk about the power of foolishness and the power of wisdom just to kind of set up this series real quick. The first one is the power of foolishness. You know, and you probably know this just like I do. One foolish decision has the potential to derail your whole life. And some of us laugh awkwardly, hopefully. But we know that one foolish decision, you make the wrong investment without contacting the right people, and you could be derailed for the rest of your life. You marry the person that you, uh, so many people have warned you about, and hopefully that is not the person sitting next to you. But the people who know you go, man, this, this isn't going to work out. He or she is not right for you, and you do it anyways. It doesn't mean you can't stay married. It doesn't mean you can't have a happy marriage. But time and again, you pick the wrong spouse, and it's bad. You go into the wrong career. You don't go into a career. You choose the wrong thing. Maybe you pick up a bottle or drugs, or maybe you pick up something else, and it derails your whole life. Many of you know because you've seen people who have done this. One foolish decision 
just one has the ability to derail your whole life. And you know because you've watched your kids do it and your grandkids and your friends or maybe you and you wish you could take that one decision back. Now the power of wisdom is pretty much the opposite. You know, one wise decision, one wise decision has the potential to keep you from many foolish ones. I mean, you marry the right person. I'm not suggesting that there is a right person myth that if you don't marry the right person, you have now made it so someone else can't marry the right person. The right person for you, that God has given you, that you have said, I am going to be in a covenant relationship with this person. They, they match me real well. How many foolish decisions can they keep you from? Or if you have wise counsel and you talk with people before you make a, a big decision, it can keep you from a lot of bad ones. That's why wisdom is so important. And it's probably helpful that we define it. So what is wisdom? It's, it's often this nebulous thing out there. So I brought like a non-Christian definition, and we'll get another one a little bit later. So what is wisdom? That's the question. What is it? How do I obtain it? How do I know it when I see it? Is it just experience? Is it knowledge? It's actually none of those things. It's a combination of a few different things. This is just my definition. Wisdom is using past experiences, knowledge, and good judgment in the present for a better future. This is just my definition. It's going, okay, I have some experience in this area. It might be investing. It might be family. It might be in a problem. It might be volunteering. It might be doing something else. But you can tell someone else immediately. You know when someone is an expert. That's why you call them. You go, hey, what should I do here? And you know immediately, like, like a mechanic. I just had to get my car worked on not too long ago, and, and Jason was very helpful with that. And he knows exactly what's going to happen immediately. He's like, oh, here's your problem. Because they know what to look for, and they have experience doing it. And then good judgment is you go, I know how to take some of these pieces and realize that if I do this, it will go that way. And if I do this, it will go that way. But if I do this one, it'll propel my future forward. So this is just my definition. This is not a Christian definition, and we will get one um, from King Solomon. And one of the last things I want to do is we've been going through this Bible in a year series, and what we've done is we've kind of gone, we're kind of going from cover to cover, which means we spend a lot of time in the Old Testament. And kind of through, the, through this process, we want to make sure that we connect the Old Covenant or the Old Testament, Genesis through Malachi, to be able to connect them to the New Testament. Because oftentimes when you pick up a Bible, you go, man, these seem like two different books, and they're not. And we want to connect wisdom with the New Testament as well. The gospel connection is this. You know, love atones for sin, but wisdom will avoid it. God will ultimately atone for your sin someday and your bad choices and my bad choices. But we can avoid a lot of them if we follow God's wisdom. It's a big deal. And if you're wondering where I got this from, it's from Proverbs. It's from the Old Testament. In Proverbs 16, it says this, Though love and faithfulness, sin is atoned for, and through the fear of the Lord, evil is avoided. And so the gospel connection here is that you and I have a far greater advantage than people did in the Old Testament because you and I get to be forgiven in Jesus Christ. And we can know the mind of Christ, which is wisdom personified, not in a person um, in the Old Testament, but a new person in the New Testament, Jesus Christ. He is the personification of wisdom itself. And we'll get to that when we get to the New Testament next year. So you're going to have to wait a little bit. So we're going to be talking about Proverbs 1 today. With the time I have left today, we're going to be talking about Proverbs 1. Now, Proverbs are written by a guy named King Solomon. Um, back in the Old Testament, about four or five books, I think, from here, uh, b before this, um, in the book of Kings, you meet a guy named Solomon. Solomon is the son of King David, arguably Israel's greatest king that has ever served. David had the heart of God, and he was actually picked because God says, I am looking for a man after my own heart. And it would be easy to say that if David had the heart of God, then Solomon had the mind of God. But Scripture doesn't quite describe it that way. You know, Solomon, he, he starts to come to the throne as a young man. David dies. He tries to prepare his son, King Solomon. And Solomon, when he gets on the throne, he's a little bit uh, trepidant. He's a little bit like, I'm too young for this. I don't have experience. So God visits him in a dream one day. And God basically says, I was with your father. And I want to honor you too. Ask, what do you want ask. Isn't that an amazing question? Don't you think it would be amazing if God came to us one night and be like, whatever you want, it's yours. It's a very dangerous question, too. 
And Solomon, who's, who at least says a little bit of wisdom, he doesn't ask for riches, he doesn't ask for a long life, he doesn't ask for the death of his enemies, all the things that God did not want him to ask for. He asks for good judgment and he, being able to discern and judge but for his people. He wants to be a good king. And, and God claps and he says, that's the right answer. And he gives Solomon wisdom. And arguably Solomon was the greatest mind that has ever lived. But because he asked for this, God gave him the rest. He says, you know, because you didn't ask for all these other things, I'm going to give you riches, and I'm going to give you protection from your enemies, and I'm going to give you all of the desires of your heart because you asked for the right thing, wisdom above all. And so Solomon becomes the smartest man who has ever lived. He writes or sings about 3,000 proverbs, about 1,500 songs or something like that. We've got a compilation of about 31 of them. Learn one of them in Proverbs. And so if you're looking for something to do, you could read a Proverbs every day, and that would be super helpful for you. But today we're going to start off with Proverbs number one. And Proverbs one, again, is from King Solomon. He's setting up the rest of the book. He's setting up the purpose of wisdom. And so here's what he said in Proverbs one. It says his name in the first opening verses here. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. He says, for learning wisdom and discipline, he sets up the case for why wisdom is so important. For understanding, for insightful sayings, for receiving prudent instruction, righteousness, justice, and integrity. For teaching shrewdness to the inexperienced, knowledge and discretion to a young man. So, I mean, he's thinking about who he's writing to, the next generation, you know, his sons. He wants them to live a better life. He says, let the wise person listen and increase in learning. Let a discerning person obtain guidance for understanding a proverb or a parable, the words of the wise and their riddles. And then he tells us exactly what wisdom is. He gives us a much better definition than I gave you. Here's what he says. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, and fools despise wisdom and discipline. He basically separates the entire world into two categories, something that Jesus would do so many times. He basically says, you got the foolish people, and then you got the wise people. And the people who are wise begin their life with a fear and an awe of the Lord. Now, the way I've tried to translate this fear is I try to describe to people, because, you know, when I was first becoming a Christian, I was like, I don't really want to follow a God I'm afraid of all the time. Like, that just sounds terrible. And so I had to describe this way to me once, and so I'm giving it back to you, is that they described this person, this pastor, who said, you know, the fear of the Lord is kind of like an immense tidal wave. It's beautiful, but it's also powerful. And you can ride it, or you can stand under it, and it will crush you. And both of those are ways of thinking about how we should fear God, because he is beautiful and powerful and majestic. And if you are with him, he will carry you a long ways. But if you are opposed, and you try to stand and yell at the wave, it will crush you in an instance. And it's both of those. We should have a healthy fear of God, which we're going to talk about at the end of this message. But we should also be in awe of who he is, which is what Solomon is trying to say. You should be both in fear of and in awe of the Lord. And when you start here, you begin to achieve wisdom. And so Solomon says, listen, my son. Again, a personal address to this nature. And we get to to look in on his conversation or at least his writing with maybe family members and people. He says, listen, my son, for your father's instructions and don't reject your mother's teachers. And again, the lady said, amen to that, right? For they will be a garland of favor on your head and a pendant around your neck. A lot of metaphorical language here. My son, and now it gives him kind of the first warning. If sinners entice you, don't be persuaded. You know, this is as relevant now as it was back then. You know, the Proverbs were probably written somewhere between 1000 BC and 700 BC, and people compiled them and found them, and a group of wise men had put them together, these these sayings of Solomon's. They proliferated throughout the kingdoms. And so just back then, it would be easy for people to say, hey, come join us in our fray. That hasn't changed in 3,000 years. And he kind of gives an example. If they say... Come with us, and let's set an ambush, and let's attack and kill someone. Let's attack some innocent person just for fun. Let's swallow them alive like shale, the grave, whole like those who go down to the pit. We'll find all kinds of valuable property, and we'll fill our houses with plunder. You know, this is 3,000 years ago. This is just as relevant today. There are people who say, come join us. Let's take advantage of people. Let's rob this bank. 
Let's harm someone at night. Come with us. There are so many rewards to get. Either you take advantage of, you harm, you pray on the weak, or you do something else. And it's amazing that people say yes to this. It says, throw in your lot with us. We'll all share in the loot. There will be a reward at the end of this evil. My son, don't travel the road with them or set foot on their path because their feet are run towards evil and they hurry to shed blood. I love the, the visual. He's like, he's like, don't even step on that path because if you take one step, you may take two. You know, I don't know if anybody has ever born who says, you know what, I would love to grow up to uh, pillage and plunder. You know, they don't, they don't go to class and the teacher's like, what do you want to be? I want to be an astronaut. Oh, that's pretty cool. You know, what do you want to be? You want to be a doctor? Oh, that's very good. What do you want to be? Uh, I want to rob people in a park in New York. Okay, you can leave class. Like, no, you would, we wouldn't let that. It's like this slow stepping onto a path that leads inevitably to a path of evil. He says, it is useless to spread a net where they or any bird can see it, but they set an ambush to kill themselves and they attack their own lives. He's basically saying in doing evil to other people, they're doing evil to themselves. And eventually it will catch up. He says, such are the paths of all who make profit dishonestly. So now he kind of opens it up. It's not just about like going and robbing people. He says, it's, it's not only that, it starts way before that. It may not even be a physical altercation. It could just be a digital transaction. I know not in his time, but in ours. It could be a phrase or a word. It could be talking someone out of something. He says, even dishonestly, you don't have to harm anyone physically to do harm to them in their life. It takes the lives of those who receive it. And then he kind of switches gears, and he shows the personification of wisdom as a woman. And he says this. He says, wisdom calls out in the street. And he places you and I, because even though this is 3,000 years ago, we still have streets. And he says, wisdom is available and ready and on your path. And she beckons towards you. Wisdom calls out in the street. She makes her voice heard in the public squares. She cries out above all the commotion of our lives, of their lives, of what's going on in society. She, her voice goes above the rest. We just can tune her out. She speaks at the entrance to the city gates. You know, for you and I, it might be the entrance to a city. It might be a center square. It might be where people gather. But in their time, in order to get into some of the city, you had to pass through her gates and pass by a guard and be checked on the way in. And she stands there before you enter here. Listen to me. And I wish that her, her thoughts and her words were kind at first, but they're not. She says this, how long, inexperienced ones, will you love ignorance? Now, ignorance is not an offensive word. If you were to call someone stupid or dumb, that would be offensive. Ignorance is just a lack of knowledge. There are lots of things I'm ignorant about. There are lots of things that you are ignorant about. But she says, how long will you love it? How long will you mockers enjoy mocking and you fools hate knowledge? If you respond to my warning, then I will pour out my spirit on you and I will teach you my words. Since I called out and you refused, and since I extended my hand and no one paid attention, since you neglected my counsel and did not accept my correction, I in turn will laugh at your calamity. Now this is kind of harsh because this is actually God speaking. There's not some alternate being who's a female, who's actually wisdom. Wisdom is coming from God. They just personify it as a woman here, so it's more understandable. They give a beautiful metaphor and a beautiful picture of where she's at to say she's readily available at any time. But it's also harsh because all of us can think back to a time where we did not make a wise decision. And we would have loved for someone to rise above the calamity and say, hey, hey, time out, time out. Don't do that thing. And here's why. Here's where it will take you. Here, I've been there before. I Trust me, I've seen it in other people. It will not go well for you. Do not do that thing. We would have paid a fortune for someone to come and be in our lives and save us from a massively fool, foolish decision. But at the same time, she says, look, you get what you deserve if you don't listen. If you don't want to think wisely, and if you don't want to go with my advice, and if you don't want to seek God's wisdom, you kind of get what you deserve. And part of us really understands that. You know, as a Christian, it's kind of hard because we love grace. You know what we don't love? 
consequences for stupid decisions. We're just like, ah, oh, could you not only forgive me, but also get me out of this? And God's like, I, I'll probably do the first one. But you're still going to experience a consequence on the bad action that you, that you did. You still may have to go to jail. You still may lose the relationship. You still may lose everything that you own. Know that I forgive you and I love you. But you still may have to go through that poor decision that you made. God does not guarantee that he will get us out of every circumstance. He does not. And anyone who tells you that otherwise is selling something. He does forgive. And that's more important than anything else. She says, I will mock when terror strikes you, kind of harsh, like a storm and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when trouble and stress overcome you. And then they will call to me, because we always do this, and this is so relatable. Don't we seek correction and wisdom and advice after we do something dumb? Totally. But then they will call me, but I won't answer. They'll search for me, but they won't find me because they hated knowledge. They didn't choose to fear the Lord. They were not interested in my counsel and they rejected all of my correction. They will eat the fruit of their way and be glutted with their own schemes. So encouraging, right? And then it ends, it says, for the apostasy, the person who has turned away from God and their faith. is essentially what apostasy means. Of the inexperienced will kill them. And the complacency of fools will destroy them. But whoever listens to me, and she finally gives an invitation at the end, whoever listens to me will securely live and be undisturbed by the dread of danger. We'd love to have this last sentence, right? We would love to live secure, confident, better lives. And we would love to be undisturbed by what is going on in society or in the world, or in our lives, or in our family, or in our jobs, or in our heads. We would love to have this last sentence. And essentially Solomon is saying, you can. The reason that you don't, and the reason that I don't, the reason that we don't, is because we don't ask the question, what should I do according to God's wisdom? And when we don't ask that question, we'll ask the other two. What can I do? What do I want to do? And neither of those are based on God's wisdom. So I wanted to make this practical for you. I wanted to give you a few pieces of, uh, of advice that I, I found from Scripture. They're not my own. They're just kind of a way of deriving and synthesizing what we've been talking about real quick. And I want to talk about it this way. You know, the wise person has a better life. And I want to give you a couple different ways. The wise person has a better life. Now, there are a lot of smart people who don't have good lives. I'm not talking about smart people. And there are a lot of people who aren't so smart who have great lives. But neither of those are wisdom. Because wisdom takes experience and knowledge and the presence for a better future. But ultimately, wisdom is someone who says, what does God have to say about this subject that I need to apply? Because before we call someone, and I'm not saying you shouldn't do this, maybe we should ask God first. Maybe we should see if he has written on it. You know, the Proverbs, there are 31 of them. He deals with so many different things. He deals with marriage. He deals with different types of wood, like trees and stuff like that. He deals with investing. He deals with fools. He deals with wisdom. He deals with so many different topics. Maybe because he knew that at some point our attention spans would be about this big, and so we needed to get something really quick. So if you read Proverbs, you can read one proverb and get like 50 pieces of advice in one proverb. And then you start to apply them, and you're like, oh my gosh, this stuff actually works. And you're like, yeah, it's kind of why it's there. And so I'm just going to give you a few of them. The first one is the wise person has a better life because they fear God more than they fear anything else. I mean, this is where Solomon told us to start. He said, if you don't begin here, you're not going to go anywhere. And let me like, kind of give this a, a personality. You and I fear more about what our spouse will say, what our boss will say, what our friends will say, what people at church will say, or what our own conscience will say before we fear God. We are so afraid of all the things in our life that we forget the one who gave us life in the first place. We are so afraid of our choices or our inaction in this world. We're far more afraid of people than we are of God, if we're being honest with ourselves. Because there are lots of times we would make a different decision if we truly looked into God's word and says, what does he say to do? 
He tells us to be generous, compassionate, and kind. He tells us even to to take people out of our lives who are harmful to us. And we'll keep those people in because they're family, because they're people we can't seem to say no to. We are far more afraid of people than we are of God. And that is where we get off kilter first. Oswald Chambers wrote this. He said, you know, the remarkable thing about fearing God is that when you fear God, you fear nothing else. Whereas if you do not fear God, you fear everything else. And he is so right. If you're wondering who this guy is, he wrote, you know, one of the best devotionals of all time, my utmost for his highest, super wise guy. He says, if you don't fear God, you will find something else to fear. And you know what? He's absolutely right. Because you know what the number one command in the Bible is? Do not be afraid. It's crazy that God would say that. Because he knows that if you have him, there is nothing that the world or people can do to you that is in comparison for what God can do for you. You cannot fear anyone or be in awe of anyone but God. Number two, the wise person has a better life because they seek the counsel of those who are wiser and farther along than they are. You know, this is often a problem with men. I told you I'd be an equal opportunity offender. Is that oftentimes, you know the old saying is like men won't pull over for directions? I mean, we don't have to anymore because we got a phone that tells us, which is great. We don't have to pull over anymore. There is a certain aspect, and again, this doesn't mean that women don't have this. It simply means that it rears its ugly head more often than not in men. There is a pride aspect to us that is ugly. We want to be the person who can provide, the person who knows it, the person who has experience, and the person who knows what they're talking about. I can't tell you how many times I've been, and I'm like, man, is that what I sound like? I I go to different places, especially at automotive stores. I don't know why. If you're an automotive person, I'm not picking on you. I'm just giving an example. It happens all the time where someone will come in, and they feel like they have to know more than the person who's like literally an expert in that field. Like, what kind of engine do you have? And they'll tell him, be like, oh, it doesn't work. He's like, sir, it actually does work. He's like, no, I, I know. And they'll go on for like 10 or 15 minutes. I was like, can't you just listen to the person with the wisdom and experience and the knowledge and the go, that's what you came here for. Like, why are you arguing? And we'll do that all the time. We will not seek the counsel of other people because we want to do it ourselves. We just want to think we're right. You know, I would rather get it right than be right. And that takes humility, something that I'm working on as well. We need to ask people, and we go, how do you do that? You know how many millionaires don't get asked how they do it? It's amazing. There are articles all over the place that people go, no one ever asked me how I do it. You know how many marriages that are successful, very few people come and ask them, how have you been married 50 years? How'd you retire early? How'd you retire at all? How do you have your kids be well-behaved? You know, just with a few questions, a lot of us could save so much heartache by simply looking at someone who is ahead of us and say, How did you do it? Will you teach me? And will you guide me? And will you help me? A wise person seeks the counsel of those who are wiser and farther along than they are. It's an incredibly impactful question. So besides these two, I wanted to give you three next steps. I think it's three. It's been a while since I wrote this message. I think it's three. Next steps, we'll find out in just a second. One is ask yourself this week, what have I been afraid of that I haven't included God in? This is a hard question because you and I have a fear. It's a fear in your marriage. It's a fear in your job. It's a fear in your future. It's a fear with your kids. And maybe part of the reason you are so afraid is that you have not included God in the conversation. You have maybe prayed and you have lamented and you have been sorry and you have prayed for the other person. But maybe what you have, you and I haven't done so far is we've been, you know, God, I am so afraid of this because I haven't handed it over to you. I haven't said, you know, I'm going to really trust you with this. It doesn't mean you just take your hands off the wheel and you don't do anything that would be irresponsible. But it does, first and foremost, we have to ask ourselves, have I just not included God in this situation, in this prayer, in this area, in this decision? We have to be honest with ourselves. What am I so afraid of that I have not included God in, or maybe it's just not in, enough for a longer period of time. Number two, just like wise counsel is important, unwise counsel is important. Ask God who you shouldn't listen to anymore 
and take action. You know, one of the best things I did when I was younger is I kicked out 90% of my friends. I did. And that sounds harsh, but they were going a different way than I was. And I did this because I had people who asked me to do this, and I had people who told me to do this. And they said, you know, that's a very wise quote, you know, I'll show your future by the you know, five people you hang around. And I looked around, and I asked myself if I wanted to be them, and I said no. And it was hard at first, because there's the people I did life with and cared about, but it was one of the best decisions that I ever made. Now, this, there's a tension here because evangelistically, you and I, if you're a Christian, are taught to go to people whose maybe lifestyles we wouldn't switch places with. But that doesn't mean they have to be inside your inner circle of counsel. You do not have to ask them for advice. You can help someone and be compassionate with them and care about their future. And at the same time, you may not say, hey, would you give me advice in this area? You can do both of those. And for some of you, you've got a family member. I'm not saying excommunicate them for the family. You're like, you're out. You're no longer invited to anything. I'm not saying that. I am simply saying that there are friends and family member and acquaintances who you've listened to for years, and all they have done is depressed you and brought you down and harmed you and even taken you away from your relationship with God. And it's time to tell them bye-bye. Again, you don't go up to them and be like, hey, went to church this morning. Uh, pastor said, you're kind of a jerk. And so this will be our last conversation. Good day. That is not what I am saying. Okay, please be clear. That is on recording. I am not saying that. I am saying is that you need to be so cautious of the people who invest in your lives and who give you wise counsel. And if they do not, they have no business investing in your life. And I'll go one step further. I know this is going to be a bit controversial. This is just my opinion. This is not scriptural as far as I know. I don't take advice from non-Christians. It's just me. Because our values are always going to be different. Or at least I don't take advice to the fact that if I can't connect it somewhere into what God has said, I'm probably not going to do it. And there are lots of non-godly things in this world that work you can gain money by stealing from someone. That works. And it's not godly at the same time. So that's just my personal opinion. Number three, next step, number three, ask someone wiser than you for advice in the little things, the big things, and as many things as you can. Take them out to coffee, buy their coffee, buy their lunch or their breakfast. Don't be weird about it. Hey, I chose you as my new mentor for the next three years. No, don't do that. That's weird, and they will tell you no, and I will encourage them to tell you no. But just ask someone, hey, can I have five minutes of your time? My wife and I are going through this. I'm thinking about making this decision. I'm thinking about traveling in this place. I'm thinking about investing in this. I'm thinking about making a career change. Someone who is wiser and farther along with you, just ask them, hey, what would you do? Do you have some advice for me? And maybe they like doing it. And here's what I know about people who are wiser and more intelligent farther along. Most of them, especially if they are a Christian, and even if they're not, a lot of them, they want to hand off their information. They want to leave a legacy. They want to give wisdom away. They want to see you succeed in life. I've never done that and be like, how dare you ask me? I hope you suck at life. Like, no one has ever said that to me. They've always said, yeah, thank you. Like, I'll see what I can do. So number three, so now, again, I'm going over my time, so I want to make sure I'm uh, continuing to go over my time, I guess. So next week, we're going to talk about next week. Next week, we're going to talk about better than gold. Next week, I want to talk about, I have no less than nine pieces of advice from Scripture next week. Nine of them. I've got a lot to tackle. I've got some fun moments in there. And so I, I want to pray for you real quick, and then I've got just a few announcements, and then we'll head out of here. So let me pray. Father, thank you for your, for your wisdom through King Solomon and ultimately through Jesus Christ, who's the personification, the epitome, and the essence of your wisdom. Lord, help us leave today learning and wanting to be wise. Lord, help us think about who in our lives maybe has no business giving us advice anymore. Lord, help us be in awe of you and to have a healthy fear that without you we should not do anything. Thank you for your son, Jesus, who without him we could do nothing.
In Jesus' name, amen. Two things real quick. Um, we have a family meeting coming up August 20th. There's also a fully engaged membership class. A lot of you have asked when is the next one. So there it is, August 23rd. We hope you'll sign up for that. And then lastly, as Holly said, this is a join a team uh, Sunday. We hope that you will make a wise decision and choose to use your gifts in the local church. You can go out into the lobby. There's a couple of ministries there. Or you can pick up our join a team. There are lots of areas of serving. We hope you do that. Thank you so much for being here today. Have a great Sunday. You're already blessed in Christ. Thanks.